Chapter 3. Suffering A year or so ago, I had a long talk on a train ride with a young American. He met me seemingly by chance, of course, there is no chance in life, and told me that he was learning Russian. He was a religious seeker who had been to all kinds of so-called Christian groups, had found nothing but hypocrisy and fakery everywhere, and had been ready to give up on religion altogether. But then he heard that in Russia, people were suffering for their faith. Where there is suffering, he thought, there will probably be something real, and there will not be such fakery as we have in America. And so he was studying Russian with the purpose of going to Russia and meeting people who were real Christians. As a Russian Orthodox priest, I was astonished to hear this, for he had never before seen an Orthodox pastor nor attended any Orthodox service. We had a long discussion about religion, and I saw that his idea was quite sound. The idea that suffering might produce something genuine, while our indulgent life easily produces fakery. In the 4th century, a great Orthodox theologian, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, also called, quote, the theologian, unquote, described our religion as, quote, suffering orthodoxy, unquote. And so it has been from the beginning, throughout the whole history of the church. The followers of the crucified God have suffered persecution and tortures. Almost all the apostles died as martyrs. Peter being crucified upside down and Andrew being crucified on an X-shaped cross. During the first three centuries of Christianity, believers fled to the catacombs and endured tremendous sufferings. It was in the catacombs that the church's divine services, which we celebrate today in a form little changed since that time, were worked out in an atmosphere of constant expectation of death. After the age of the catacombs, there was the struggle to retain the purity of the faith. When many teachers tried to substitute personal opinions for the divinely revealed teachings given by our Lord Jesus Christ. In later centuries, there were the invasions of Orthodox countries by Arabs, Turks, other non-Christian peoples, and finally, in our own days, by Communists. Communism, which has persecuted religion as it has never been persecuted before, has attacked first all precisely the orthodox lands of Eastern Europe. As can be seen, therefore, our faith actually is a suffering faith, and in this suffering, something goes on which helps the heart to receive God's revelation. What does the suffering orthodoxy of Russia the suffering religion that the above-mentioned young man wanted to see, have to say to us today. Is the truth being revealed in Russia to loving hearts? According to worldly logic, there should be no chance of this. Communism has reigned with an iron hand for over 60 years. And from the very beginning, its idea had been to, quote, stamp out, unquote, religion. For a time in the late 1930s, it almost succeeded in this aim, leaving very few churches open, unless Hitler's invasion had required the Russian people to become patriotic and have some hope in life besides that of communist ideology. The church could have been driven entirely underground. Today, the situation is somewhat better, but still there is a great deal of pressure upon believers. There was a renewed persecution in the late 1960s under Khrushchev, which resulted in about three-fourths the then-open churches being closed. At the present time, apart from the cities where tourists go, in Moscow or Leningrad, for example, you'll see perhaps 30 or 40 churches open. There are large cities in the provinces, 
with few or no churches. Thus, as a believer wants his child to be baptized, he will sometimes have to travel hundreds of miles. Here I would like to say a word about God, about how God is re- revealing himself to the suffering Christians in Russia right now. Probably all of you have heard of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a great Russian novelist and thinker who was exiled from his native land in 1975 for speaking the truth about Russia as he saw it. His age is almost exactly the same as the age of the communist regime itself, so he cannot be accused of having prejudices left over from his childhood. He lived a typical life in the Soviet Union. Born one year after the revolution, he lost his father in World War I, studied mathematics in order to get a practical job, served as a soldier in World War II, and went with the Soviet Army to Germany. In 1945, he was arrested for writing disrespectful remarks about the, quote, mustache, unquote, meaning Stalin, in private letters and received eight years in a concentration camp. At the end of this sentence, in 1953, he was exiled, he was exiled, which means he was not exactly in prison, but neither was he free to go anywhere, to a city in southern Kazakhstan, at the edge of the desert. There he contracted cancer and nearly died from it, but was healed in a cancer clinic, about which he wrote a novel, Cancer Ward. In this place of exile, he taught math and physics, and in secret wrote novels and stories. After Stalin died, there was a temporary error of, quote, thaw, unquote, or, quote, softening, unquote, and he was allowed to be free and publish one book in Russia in 1961. It was then discovered that he was more, quote, dissident, unquote, than the communist government liked, and he was not allowed to publish anything else. His novels, however, began to be published outside of Russia. This made him a very troublesome celebrity for the Soviet authorities, especially when he received the Nobel Prize in 1970 and was not allowed to receive it in person. In 1975, he was finally forcibly exiled, being given a few days notice and sent to West Germany. Solzhenitsyn now lives in Vermont, where he continues his writing. He has been speaking to the West about something very important, the meaning of the atheist experiment in Russia. He looks at this experiment not primarily from a political point of view, but from a more down-to-earth and even spiritual perspective. In a way, he is a symbol of the contemporary Orthodox revival in Russia, because he has undergone the more than 60 years of suffering of the Russian people and has come out undefeated by it. He has a very strong Christian faith and a message to the world based upon his experience. His monumental book, The Gulag Archipelago, should be read by anyone who wishes to understand atheism as it has been practiced in Russia and what it does to the human soul. Solzhenitsyn is not bitter about his experiences in the prison camp and so forth. He emerged a victor over it because he obtained Christian faith. He sees that the system of atheism is not just something Russian, but a universal category of the human soul. Once you have the idea that atheism is true and there is no God, then as Dostoevsky Dostoevsky wrote in his novels, everything becomes permitted. It becomes possible to experiment with anything that comes to you, any inspiration, any new way of looking at things, any new kind of society. Solzhenitsyn's value is that he shows that once atheism becomes the dominant philosophy and the idea is present that 
all religion must be exterminated, which is the center of communist ideology, then there must be prison camps. Man wants religion, and if it is forbidden, he must be somehow gotten rid of. Therefore, atheism, since atheism is based on the evil in man's nature, the, quote, gulag, unquote, prison system is the natural expression of the atheist experiment in Russia. This, however, is a secondary point. The main thing I would like to talk about is what happened to Solzhenitsyn in the religious sense. When he went to prison, for it was there that God was revealed to him, at the same time that the gulag reveals the evil in man's nature, it is also the starting point of for man's spiritual rebirth. This is what makes the spiritual rebirth that is now occurring in Russia much more profound than the various, quote, spiritual revivals, unquote, which are occurring in the free world. Solzhenitsyn himself says the following about how he came to the faith. Quote, it was granted me to carry away from my prison Years on my beaten back, which nearly broke beneath its load, this essential experience. How a human being becomes evil and how he becomes good. In the intoxication of youthful success, I had felt myself to be infallible, and I was therefore cruel, unquote. He was a sergeant in the army. Quote, in the surfeit of power, I was a murderer and an oppressor. In my most evil moments, I was convinced that I was doing good, and I was well supplied with systematic arguments, and it was only when I lay there on rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first strivings of good. Unquote. Here his heart begins to become soft and receptive, and thus a kind of revelation takes place. Quote, Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart, and then through all human hearts, and even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil, unquote. How much deeper is this observation than anything we in the West could say based on our own experience? It is deeper because it is based on suffering, which is the reality of the human condition and the beginning of true spiritual life. Christ himself came to a life of suffering and the cross, and the experience in Russia enables those who undergo it to see this profoundly. That is why the Christian revival in Russia is such a very deep thing. Chapter 4. Rebirth Now I'd like to say a word about a simpler man by the name of Yuri Mashkov, who gives an account of his conversion in Russia. He was forcibly exiled from Russia three years ago and, when still in his early 40s, had cancer and died last year. Just three months after arriving in this country, he gave a talk in which he told how he came to the faith, that is, how God was revealed to him through his sufferings. He had been invited to speak at a Russian conference in New Jersey in 1978. And when he came to this talk, he told the people that, before coming there, he had not known what he was going to say. Quote, I was disturbed, unquote, he said. Quote, it seemed to me that I had nothing to tell you. The first half of my life, I was a student. And the second half, I spent in prisons and political concentration camps of the Gulag. Indeed, what can I say to people who are more educated than I? More erudite and even better informed about events in the Soviet Union, unquote. Here, we can see a contrast with what happens in the West. There are, it is 
true, many people in the West being converted to orthodoxy. Usually they have a broad theoretical knowledge of orthodoxy. But not this experience of suffering and having to really, quote, pay for what you get, unquote. Yuri, on the other hand, speaks not from books, but from his own experience. Quote, therefore, unquote, Yuri says, quote, I decided not to write down my talk, but to say whatever God would place in my soul. And then, as we were hurrying away from Bridgeport, Connecticut, in a splendid automobile along the astonishing freeway, in the midst of a luxuriant nature, I understood that all my spiritually tormenting life in the communist paradise, my path from atheism and Marxism to orthodox faith, is the only valuable information that can be of interest to you. My my life is of interest only inasmuch as it is a drop in the ocean of the Russian religious rebirth, unquote. Yuri then tells about his life, quote, I was born in the bloody year of 1937 in the village of Klishev, 30 miles from Moscow. My father, a blacksmith by profession, died in the war, and I do not remember him. My mother who worked at various jobs, was, I think, indifferent to religion. My grandmother, it is true, was religious. Unquote. In fact, in Russia, you will find almost always one grandmother or mother who is religious and who will often bring the family back to faith. Quote, but she had no authority in my eyes because she was totally illiterate. Of course, I was baptized as a child, but in my school years, I took off my cross, and until the age of 25 was a convinced atheist. After finishing the seven-year primary school, I had the good fortune to enter the Moscow Higher School of Art and Industry, and I studied there five years out of the seven. Thus, outwardly, my life had begun very successfully. In time, I should have received the diploma of an artist, and would be able to work anywhere I wanted. This is typical Soviet academic biography. In the Soviet Union, academic life is taken very seriously. If you pass, you get an, an, quote, open ticket, unquote, to many good things in Soviet life. And if you fail, you get a job such as cleaning the streets. Quote, But the boring Soviet life and spiritual dissatisfaction, unquote, continues Yuri, quote, gave me no peace. And somewhere at the end of 1955, in my 19th year, there occurred an event, outworldly, unnoticeable, which however overturned my life and finally brought me here. This event occurred in my soul and consisted, in fact, in the fact that I understood in what kind of society I was living. Despite all the naked Soviet propaganda, I understood that I was living under a regime of absolute rightlessness and absolute cruelty. Very many students came to the same conclusion at this time, and in time there appeared those who thought as I did, and we all considered it our duty to tell the people about our discovery and to somehow act against the triumph triumph of evil, unquote. This, of course, reflects the idealistic current of youth, which is to be seen in the Western world also. Quote, But the secret police very carefully looked after all the citizens of the USSR, and when on November 7th, 1958, when I was just 21 years old, we gathered at an organizational meeting to decide the question of an underground publication. Six of us were arrested, and all who did not repent were given the highest punishment for anti-Soviet agitation, seven years in each concentration camp. Thus began a new path in my life, unquote. Up to here, it should be noted, there is no religious conversion at all. Yuri is still just an idealistic youth who has suddenly been, quote, squashed, unquote, 
and sent away to the gulag. Quote, All of us then were atheists and Marxists of the Euro-communist camp. That is, we believed that Marxism in itself was true teaching which leads the people to a bright future, to a kingdom of freedom and justice. And the Moscow criminals, for some reason, did not want to realize this teaching in life. In the concentration camp, this idea completely and forever died in all of us, unquote. Here I will not go into the question or philosophy of communism, but will only note the fact that Yuri was reduced to a state of despair. He lost faith in what he had once believed through his training, that communism is an idealistic teaching that brings happiness and peace. He saw that in practice, communism was not what it was claimed to be. Then something began to happen to his soul. Quote, I would like to reveal a little the process of spiritual rebirth, unquote, he says, quote, so that you can see how unfa unfailingly it is proceeding in the Russian people. It is not only I and those who were with me who have gone through the spiritual path from atheism to religious faith. This is typical. This is a typical manifestation for the Soviet people concentration camps. What is happening with our people? The process of spiritual rebirth has two stages. At first, we discern the essence of Marxism and are freed from any illusions with regard to it. Under a profound and thoughtful analysis, we discover that Marxism, in its, its essence, is a complete teaching of totalitarianism, that is, an absolute slavery. And any communist party in any country, once having undertaken the realization of the Marxist program, will be compelled to repeat what the Moscow communists have done and are doing, or else renounce Marxism and atheism and liquidate themselves. Having understood this simple truth, we lose the ideological basis on which we have opposed Marxist slavery. We fall into a spiritual vacuum which draws after it an ever profound crisis, unquote. Yuri then tells how he himself began to enter this profound crisis. Quote, after being freed from the camp, that is after seven year term, our prospects were such that we could not wish for an enemy. Either we would go back to the camp and remain there for the rest of our lives, or we might die in a psychiatric prison. Or we might be murdered by the secret police without a trial or investigation. Quote, in these conditions of spiritual crisis, with no way out, there inevitably comes up upon us the chief question of a worldview. What am I living for if there is no way out? And when this frightful moment, moment comes, each of us feels that death has caught him by the throat. If some kind of spiritual answer does not come, life comes to an end. Because without God, not only is everything permitted, but life itself has no value and no meaning. I saw in the camp how people went out of their minds or ended with suicide, and I myself clearly felt that if, after all, I came to the firm and final conclusion that there is no God, I would simply be obliged to end with suicide. Since it is, it is shameful and belittling for a rational creature to drag out a senseless and tormenting life. Thus, at the second stage of spiritual rebirth, we discover that atheism thought out to its logical end, inevitably brings a man to perdition because it is a complete teaching of immorality, evil, and death. Quote, a tragic end, suicide or man madness, would have been my lot too if, to my good fortune, there had not occurred on September 1st, 1962, the greatest miracle in my life. No event occurred on that day. There were no suggestions from outside. In solitude, I was reflecting on my problem, to be or not to be. At this time, I already realized 
that to believe in God is a saving thing. I very much wanted to believe in him, but I could not deceive myself. I had no faith. And suddenly there came a second when somehow for the first time I saw as if a door had opened from a dark room into the sunny street. And in the next second, I already knew for sure that God exists and that God is the Jesus Christ of orthodoxy and not some other God. I call this moment the greatest miracle because this precise knowledge came to me not through reason. I know this for sure, but by some other way, and I am unable to explain this moment rationally. And so by such a miracle, by my new spiritual life began, which has helped me to endure another 13 years of life in concentration camps and prisons, a forced emigration, and I hope will help me to endure all the difficulties of emigrant life. And this moment of faith, this greatest miracle, is being experienced now in Russia by thousands of people, and not only in concentration camps and in prisons, Igor Agurtsov, the founder of the Social Christian Union, came to faith not in the camps, but in the university. Religious rebirth is a typical phenomenon of contemporary Russia. Everything spiritually alive inevitably returns to God. And it is absolutely evident that such a saving miracle despite the whole might of communist politics, can be performed only by the almighty God, who has not left the Russian people in terrible sufferings and totally defenseless before many enemies. Chapter 5, Conclusion The experience of, the one, of this one man, Yuri Mashkov, shows us in a most practical way how God reveals himself Something happens in the heart, and while suffering helps his, this transformation, there is no infallible means of achieving it. For example, much literature has come out of Russia in the last 60 years describing cases of suffering people who have not converted. There is a very interesting book in English by a Russian man named Marchenko called My Testimony. Marchenko is simply an honest man who could not stand the frightful feeling of fakery in Soviet Russia, the fact that everyone lies to you. Therefore, he told the truth, and in doing this, he was sent to the camps. The, the authorities subjected him to the usual interrogations and kept telling him, quote, you know, if you keep your ideas, even if you get out, you're going to come back here. Why don't you just change and do what everyone else does, unquote. Quote, I can't, unquote, he said. Quote, I'm an honest man, unquote. Look at, looking at believers, he concluded that they were the only happy people in prison camps, since they say, quote, I'm suffering for Christ, unquote, and accept what comes to them, quote, but I can't be like them, unquote, he said, quote, because I don't believe in Christ, unquote. And so he just got mad, looked at the jailers, and wanted to pound the doors at them. When he got out of prison, he was filled with bitterness and wanted to kill off all his oppressors. He knew that he would just go back to the camp. And in fact, after he wrote his book, he was sent back again. Thus we see that in Marchenko's case, so far the heart did not melt, but remained hard of course, the heart is a very complex thing, and maybe someday he will change. His testimony, however, shows that we cannot simply put a man into prison camp and say, quote, we'll make him a Christian this way, unquote. Some become Christian and some do not. When conversion does take place, the process of revelation occurs in a very simple way. A person is in need. He suffers and then somehow the other world opens up. The more you are in suffering and in, difficult, in difficulties and are, quote, desperate, unquote, for God, the more he is going to come to your aid, reveal who he is, and show you the way to get out. 
This is why it is not spectacu a spectacular thing like miracles that we should look for. We know from the story of St. Nicetas related earlier that this is the worst possible approach and leads to deception. The right approach is found in the heart which tries to humble itself and simply knows that it is suffering and that there somehow exists a higher truth which not only can help this suffering, but can bring it into a totally different dimension. This passing from suffering to transcendent reality reflects the life of Christ, who went to his suffering on the cross, endured the most horrible and shameful type of death, and then totally to the consternation of his own disciples, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent his Holy Spirit, and began the whole history of his church. That is basically what I wanted to say about Revelation and Orthodoxy. You can ask some questions or have discussion on this topic.